Good morning, everyone. My name is John Pocanum. I am the Energy Infrastructure Program Manager in the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's Office of Public Participation. Over the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'd like to tell you about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's newest office, the Office of Public Participation. Why does FERC have an Office of Public Participation? How did this office come to be? And what does this office do? Before I do, let me just spend a few minutes to tell you about myself. I think it's always important to know who you're talking to. Again, my name is John Pocano. I'm currently a resident of Washington, D.C. However, I'm originally from California. Most people think I'm from Southern California because I look like a movie star. But no, I'm, in <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually a rugged Northern Californian. So, as the Energy Infrastructure Program Manager, my portfolio includes FERC-regulated pipeline issues. I've been with the Commission for almost 20 years. Most of my time with the Commission has been spent in the Office of Energy Projects, where I conducted environmental reviews of proposed natural gas transmission pipeline projects. Specifically, I began my career as an environmental analyst and finished up in that office as an environmental project manager and water resources program manager. As a brief reminder, FERC is responsible for the regulating for regulating the siting, permitting, construction of interstate natural gas transmission pipeline projects. Interstate meaning literally crossing state lines or involved in the interstate transmission of natural gas. <laughs> Sale of natural gas. FERC does not regulate production, gathering, midstream, or local distribution pipelines. Okay. I clicked twice and here I am, so I'm good. When I agree to speak at conferences and such, I try to be very mindful of the conference's theme and the audience. In preparing for this conference and thinking about the future of pipeline safety, which begins with the siting and continues through the life of a project, and taking into account the time and hard work that many of you have dedicated to this issue, as proven by the presentations and discussions we've heard this morning, I feel very confident in saying, the future of pipeline safety includes public participation. I think not long ago, a statement like this may have been considered bold, maybe optimistic, maybe naive. However, I think the existence of an office entitled the Office of Public Participation proves this point. And I'll go a step farther and say that the future of pipeline planning and regulation will include public participation. So let's talk about the Office of Public Participation. The Office of Public Participation's mission is to empower, promote, and support public voices at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I think this is significant. If you'd asked me five years ago who at the FERC was responsible for empowering, promoting, and supporting voices, public voices at the FERC, I think I may have looked at you awkwardly. And I would have been hard-pressed to point to an individual or an office whose focus was doing this kind of work. And to be honest, I don't think FERC staff would have used the words empower, promote, and support public voices. I think I would have said, if you give us a comment, we will look at it. So again, I think this is significant. A sea change, maybe. Before I go any farther, I have to stop here and promote the office's contact information. I was explicitly told, promote the office's contact information. <laughs> the fact is, we are a new office, just over a year old. People don't know that we exist or what we're trying to do. In fact, one of the office's current priorities and one of the main reasons I'm here is to let people know FERC has an Office of Public Participation. I do want to point out the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, and the YouTube. And I'll say currently with Twitter. This Twitter's kind of a thing up in the air, right? <laughs> so. I like this slide, because it looks like people are thinking. And if they're thinking, they, mu they must be curious, inquisitive. You look like an inquisitive crowd. Hopefully you're thinking about this presentation in OPP. However, I suspect many of you are thinking about what's for lunch. I can't say I blame you. We're in New Orleans, and food in New Orleans is world-renowned. On the off chance that you're still with me, and thinking about OPP, 
I'm guessing you're thinking, why does FERC have an Office of Public Participation? And how did the Office of Participation come to be? The easy answer to the first question is that in 1978, Congress added a provision to the Federal Power Act establishing within FERC an Office of Public Participation. At that time, over 40 years ago, Congress saw a need for an office at FERC to coordinate assistance to the public with, with respect to authorities exercised by the Commission. 40 years ago, it was acknowledged that the public would benefit from assistance. So the question then becomes, why did it take 40 years to establish an office? I think to fully answer that question will take more time than I have. So in the interest of time, I'm going to fast forward 30, 35 years when public interest in FERC matters grew significantly. However, I want to acknowledge that there are those of you here who have expressed significant concern to FERC throughout that time. Let's go back a few years. We witnessed at FERC an unprecedented growth in concern for natural gas pipeline projects. We saw increased comments to the commission. We saw demonstrations. We saw protests. These are things that we had not seen at FERC previously. I think this concern, along with similar significant concerns for other commission actions, maybe more on the market side and some of the um, other orders that, that the commission issues, let some determined individuals and groups to redouble their efforts and advocate for an office to assist the public. And well, what do you know, there was an office already on the books. So at the direction of Chairman Glick, and with the involvement of other commissioners, especially Commissioner Clements, work finally began on the creation of the Office of Public Participation. I'd like to note that the establishment of the Office of Public Participation began with public participation. There were six listening sessions to flesh out the office and, and talk about what the office should do and what the goals of the office should be. It was a full day virtual commissioner led workshop with uh, direct feedback from 29 stakeholders. There was a written com a 60 day written comment period from March uh, through May 2021. Hundreds of comments were submitted in the docket, all of which culminated in a report to Congress. I think that's significant that an office of public participation began with public participation. I think it's a little unusual. Offices sometimes just appear, there's some internal workings, but this office went to great pains to involve the public in what it should be doing. So here we are, December 1st, 2022. OPP has had a permanent director for one year, and in the past year, she has brought on a staff of 11 energy industry analysts and specialists to begin empowering, promoting, and supporting public voices at the commission. I'd like to take a step back for a minute to give some context to OPP's mission statement. I'd like to share with you some of my prior FERC experience. As an environmentalist, an environmental analyst and project manager uh, with almost 20 years at the commission, I visited hundreds of communities across the country, from Alaska to Florida, from New York to Oregon. I've walked pipeline rights away with hundreds of landowners, sat in community meetings with hundreds of concerned citizens. And all my time doing this work, I encountered members of the public who often felt overwhelmed by a strange federal agency located hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles away. I encountered members of the public who were often frustrated and unable to navigate the alphabet soup of acronyms and websites that weren't intuitive to them or designed with them in mind. I encountered members of the public who were doing all they could to get by and just felt like there was no one there for them to help them in their concern and address their concerns. I like to think that the Office of Public Participation is working to make it easier for the public to be involved in the commission, proceeding, commission proceedings. On our website, under our mission statement, one will find a list of functions. And the very first function is to engage with the public through direct outreach and education to facilitate greater understanding of commission processes and solicit broader participation in matters before the commission. Like many things, easy to say, but what is OPP actually doing? So here are some of the OPP's current actions, what we've done in the past year. We are doing what we call constituent service, constituent service. These are phone and email inquiries. I don't know how many of you have called the federal agency before. There's not generally one way to get to somebody. You get bounced around from office to office to office to office. OPP is a soft landing spot for people that, that we can then help them get them to the right people they need to talk to. It's a place to have questions answered. I have a question, I don't know who, who to go to. Is it this office or that office? 
Some things are very simple, like finding a docket, finding a project. I live in some county in Ohio and there's this pipeline. I don't know what it's called. I don't know what the docket number is. I don't know. I can't find it. You can call us and we can help you find that. We can help you navigate our administrative record, our e-library system. We are reaching out to communities and expanding notification. I like to think of OPP as one of those things like, oh, you know, I wish I knew about that because that would have made my life a lot easier. How many times have we all stumbled into something and thought that would have been great if I'd known that two years ago or a year ago? And this is so great that this is out there. How come I didn't know? What we're trying to do is take this office to the people so that you know. I think a lot of times in my experience at FERC, we put something out there and you need to find your way to it. Who knows how you do that? You know, it's on a website. Somebody told me, somebody told me, somebody told me. Here, we're trying to come out there and tell you, hey, we're here, this is out here, we have these services for you. So we've been meeting with uh, a lot of NGOs, some that you wouldn't think of that we would normally interact with. Um, you think of Sierra Club, American Rivers, some of those types of groups, not for natural gas so much, American Rivers, but <coughs> Sierra Club and whatnot, some of the bigger NGOs, but there are a lot of NGOs uh, working to address concerns in their community. We're trying to identify them and say, hey, we're here. You may not have a project in your area yet, but someday you might. You may know somebody who we don't know. Can you connect us? We're out there, you know, sort of shaking the bushes, shaking hands, letting people know we exist, learning from them, kind of find out how do we contact with you? How do we reach to you? How do you reach your people so we can then reach them in turn? So we're out there building contacts. We're expanding notification. Uh, like all federal agencies, FERC has regulations. Thou shalt do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes X, Y, and Z is what you're supposed to do, but you could do more. But we all have limited resources, so what we're trying to do is take on and do that more. FERC generally sends out notifications to affected landowners, abutters, and folks list uh, in a certain radius of a project facility. You know, we can send that notification to churches, to civic organizations, the Moose, the Masons, we can send it to the Chamber of Commerce, to the unions. We can send it to people that, that tell us, hey, you need to talk to this person. They know somebody. Advisory, neighborhood advisory commissions. And we are trying to find people, leaders in the community to send out our notifications. Because again, you're not, I don't think it's reasonable to just expect you to find your way to, to FERC. We need to find you and let you know something's going on so then you can activate your network. We are hosting community meetings and site visits. This is actually my second time here this month. I was here a couple weeks ago meeting the East New Orleans Neighborhood Advisory Commission. They wanted to make us aware of concerns that they're having in East New Orleans. We went down to Plaquemines Parish to see sort of this specific visit for an environmental justice tour. If that community feels it's overburdened with industrial facilities, FERC has some of those facilities maybe in the future, we need to be exposed to it. As in my previous job at FERC, I always felt very fortunate to be out into the world because you can read about things in DC, but when you see them with your own two eyes, when you walk out there in the area, when you talk to people, you look them in the eye, I think you get a greater appreciation from it. So those are some things that we're doing there. We're offering educational and technical assistance. We're preparing explainers, handouts, things that are written in plain spoken English. Uh, I think a barrier for participation is often techno babble, acronyms. You know, you get these 20-page rule rulemakings, you get these 1,000-page EISs. Can we boil that down and put that in plain spoken English? Something that's easily digestible and in, you know, a way people can understand it so they can then become involved. We are offering comment filing assistance. You know, we assume that everyone's comfortable with the internet and that we're all moving forward, but, you know, it is, it is challenging. Um, we do our best. I think we have a very good system, but I acknowledge that it, that has, it could be improved. So we're there. I need help filing a document. How do I do that? How do I attach a PDF? How do I do this quick comment function that you have? So we're there to answer those questions to help people get their comments in. We are also sharing uh, information on social media. We are trying to find other ways to reach people. Twitter, again, I mentioned that before. Instagram, Facebook, you know, people are using these tools and we want to be you know, getting the information to people where they are. I mentioned those tools because we're also thinking about things like AM radio. And I, I think it's, it kind of blows my mind that the future might be AM radio. <laughs> but you know, there are people still out there who get plenty of information from AM radio. You know, we sort of think that newspapers are gone, but there are plenty of newspapers still out there. Maybe they're not dailies and they're weeklies, but people read the paper. And I don't think that we, we should 
take our offices think we should take them for granted or not post in those anymore. So we're, we're looking at all forms of media, also with the mind on, on new media. I think one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in or really proud of that we're doing is we're having regional staffing now. Uh, prior to hiring this one individual here in the Southeast, most of FERC staff is based in Washington, D.C. And again, we're sometimes hundreds, thousands of miles away. There's a disconnect. Having people in regions and in areas where there are projects gives us a local perspective, gives us somebody that we can send down to a meeting. You know, we find out about a county meeting or some sort of local meeting. We have to navigate from D.C., you know, the, the travel process, which is not easy. I don't know how many people are federal employees here, but concur in some of those programs that we have to manage are just uh, cumbersome. But how we here we have somebody we can just send down to a meeting. We can have somebody come talk to somebody. I think it's great that we're doing that. We hired somebody in the southeast region here to handle projects on the Gulf Coast. We're looking to add somebody in the Northeast and another person across the country. So that's, those are some of the things that we are currently doing. Some of the things that we are thinking about doing is trying to improve our language access and translation services. Not everyone speaks English. Not everyone speaks English proficiently. You know, these are communities that have been traditionally underrepresented and not served well. So can we translate our documents? When we have meetings, can we have a translator there? Can we have a translator available when somebody calls in? So I think that, that's something we're exploring. We are, and I mentioned this earlier about AM radio, you know, communications to those without high-speed internet. Uh, a lot of people in this country live in an area where they do not have high-speed internet. You know, these websites that we have work great if you have high-speed internet, but not everyone does. So how do we structure ourselves so that those people are involved? Uh, I had a project out in Oregon in my former job here at FERC, and we tried to break down documents into you know, 20 megabyte chunks so that somebody could download them over a Wi-Fi network. Because a lot of times you just drop a thousand page PDF with a lot of graphics and figures. That'll take two days to download if it can be, if it can be done. So we're thinking about ways to reach out to those folks and make sure the information is accessible to them. We are thinking about recommendations to improve NEPA scoping process. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a FERC NEPA scoping meeting. Give us your comments. That's it. So <laughs> we like to think about how can we improve that? How can we make it easier for people to give us comments? They, they told us they want to know a little bit more about what's going on. I can't comment if I don't understand. And I can't understand because this is a thousand pages of things that don't exactly make sense to me. Can you boil this down? Can you help me understand the process and the project so that then you can improve our comments to you? So those are things that we're thinking about. We are thinking about outreach to traditionally underrepresented communities. You hear environmental justice this morning, uh, indigenous populations, underserved populations, rural populations, folks that don't automatically come to mind. And again, this is maybe a disconnect from being thousands of miles away, but are there different ways to reach them? Uh, AM radio, for instance, do we go door to door knocking? Do we prepare flyers that people can put up on the bulletin boards in the feed store or their corner store? Those are, those are things that we're thinking about doing. We're thinking about meeting facilitation. I'd like to come and talk to people at FERC. I want them to hear what I have to say. We can, we can act as a facilitator and have host people at the commission. Uh, other things we're thinking about are technological improvements to our website. Information organization, it's on the website. Well, where on the website? It's six clicks into the website. Maybe we can put it so it's only one or two clicks into the website. Uh, those are things that we're thinking about. Internal process improvements. Like everyone, we can always improve. So we're thinking about ways on our side in terms of how we process information, how we take uh, comments from the public. Can we make that better or easier? I just wanted to show the, the picture of our website here Why I tell you about a meeting that we had two weeks ago. There was a group of landowners, or a group of community members from the Texas Gulf Coast who lived in a highly industrialized <coughs> area where a FERC project is located, several FERC projects are located. And they are very concerned about how pipelines and LNG terminals and energy infrastructure affects their community. They have been concerned for years. They have been spending hours of their time, and I, I, not just 10 hours, you know, hundreds of hours of their time, not paid, volunteering their time after school, you know, after they pick up their kids at night, reading, trying to learn on the process. They have concerns that they want to be heard. They want people to understand what they're going, what they're doing. So this, this group of community uh, activists, community members, I don't know if they would call themselves community activists, people that care about their community, 
came to Washington, D.C., and we hosted them in our office, and they said, you know, we have these concerns. We are here to, we, what can you, how can you help us? What can you do for us? And it was really impressive, because in my time at FERC, there's not a lot of group of landowners that come in and get a meeting. And I say landowners, you know, you don't have to be a landowner to be concerned about a project. These were people who lived in town, people that weren't necessarily 500 feet from a pipeline. They were five miles from a pipeline, but they understand the impacts and they have the various concerns that they do. Uh, they sat down with us and they shared their stories. They told us how these projects were affecting them personally, how they were affecting their communities, the challenges they had in forming their neighbors, getting people involved, navigating the FERC process, the FERC website, hundreds of hours of time spent, their worries, their concerns, they shared that all with us. And they asked us, will someone in the government listen? Because it doesn't feel often that someone in the government does listen. You send your letters, they don't get responses. The government doesn't have resources to respond to thousands of individual letters. So it's nice to have somebody to talk to, I think. Someone to come in and look in the eye and say, hey, these are my concerns. They asked us for help in educating their community, educating them and their community. They asked us for help navigating the acronyms and the concepts found in, in the applicant documents and the operator documents and in FERC documents. They wanted to know where they can offer their comments, where they can participate, not just for the immediate action in front of them, but in the future. You know, we've seen the life of a pipeline is, is 50 to 100 years. They're thinking about tomorrow, not just today. Some of these people live with the projects in their backyards, literally. And what we were able to do, and I think it was, it was this is one of the first meetings I've been involved with in OPP, we, we listened. And I think that was a great relief. They had a lot to share, and sometimes you know, sharing that is, is helpful. Uh, we offered to expand the outreach. So in this particular community, we will build a list where we can contact the churches when notices come out, the Chamber of Commerce, the unions, uh, the local groups that come together. We're going to provide try, try to provide a flyer for bulletin boards. All these all these ways that we're trying to expand outreach. We gave them advice. You know, people think often that they need to be invited to comment. One does not need to be asked to comment in order to provide your comment. You can put that in the record anytime you want to. And it, it will get read, and it does make a difference. And then we thought collectively together, how can we help engage? Maybe, maybe our office comes down and holds an open house. Maybe our office comes down and it meets with a lot of groups of individuals. Maybe we have a, a meeting of our own where we invite people in, where we can educate them about the project and share with them our experiences, and what we think they can do to better participate in the process. So that's pretty exciting stuff. That is, those aren't things that we, we've done before. Uh, you know, oftentimes we would just refer people to our website or to the regulations, and then here we're taking a very proactive approach, and I, I'm really proud to be a part of that. So I have to say what OPP is not. OPP is not an advocacy office. We cannot take your side. We cannot advocate to the commission that this community does not want this pipeline. We don't think they should have this pipeline. We are not an advocate, we are a facilitator, an educator, someone to help you uh, navigate the commission processes. OPP is not a decisional <coughs> office. If, if someone approaches us or a group approaches us with trying to make their case, we're not involved in decisions. That's done by other offices of the commission and ultimately the commissioners themselves. So those are things that we do not do. Uh, one of the things that we when I want to stop here for a second because you'll often hear federal employees talk about ex parte. And ex parte is kind of a showstopper because it goes to the merits of a case. OPP staff is non-decisional, so ex parte is not an issue for us. We can talk about the merits of your project. We can offer you some advice, share with you some experiences, maybe connect you to other folks that have gone through similar uh, processes. We can do those things. We don't, we don't throw up, I'm sorry, it's ex parte. We can't talk anymore. And I've, I've seen the look in people's eyes when ex parte comes out and it's sort of deflating. So it's nice not to, to have to say, that's ex parte, we can't talk to you about that. So I got the sign that my time is running a little short. Uh, so I want to bring this to close on a positive note. And in my mind, OPP's <coughs> mission is set, but how OPP ultimately fulfills that mission is not yet set. As we all know, there are many ways and ever-evolving ways to serve the public. Our office is committed to serving the public, and we welcome your thoughts and suggestions and we'd be very happy to meet with you to discuss how OPP can fulfill its mission. 
So I want to stop there and, and move to some question and answers here in just a minute, but I wanted to go back and go, there you go. So that is, in a nutshell, OPP. Uh, questions? Yes? Can I get you to move me one slide? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, everything I heard was sounded really good. I was wondering two things. One, if you listened to the 1185 I this did. morning and whether you've been kind of briefed on that and know how that might impact your office. And uh, the, the more important one is north of the border, the Canadian Energy Regulator has a similar office and they provide millions of dollars for participation of, com of you know, the public. Gets that money and can hire experts to to explain things to them they don't understand themselves and explain things to the commission up there. Uh, is there any plan for your office to provide money like that? So, discussion, yes. I'm not sure a plan, I wouldn't go so far as to say a plan, but we are discussing the possibility of intervener funding. Uh, the, the, the NEB up, up north does it. I think the state of California does it. Uh, so there are some discussions internally about providing intervener funding in the future for groups to act because as I pointed out and as we all know, people are volunteering their time or spending money out of their pocket to better be involved in these processes. So I think there is an interest in that and that's something that we are exploring and I think that's definitely on the table in the future. Do we have another question? Does that answer your question? Great. Hey John, Dave Mulligan with uh, FINSA Community Liaison. So um, I think we worked in the past on Jordan Cove, you were... So my question is, they already, in the process, in the, in the project uh, process, um, they have to do town hall meetings and it, with the communities and things. Will this new OPP office be replacing that in, in conducting those early town hall meetings or you will be a separate entity to the, that was in the NEPA process, correct? Yes. So in the FERC process, the applicants will often do uh, town hall meetings, open houses. They'll go out and explain their project uh, from their perspective to the community. FERC will sometimes do its own sort of open house or listening session or uh, participate in that process. I think we will supplement that and be another resource available at those. Uh, I think we'll be interfacing with industry, you know, with some suggestions on how to improve those sessions. And I know for, uh, the industry is actively trying to you know, assess where they are and some are making improvements in their open houses. So we will not replace any of those activities, but we will supplement and advise because I think our focus is on the public participation where there are different focuses in play. You know, the commission, the, the energy project staff wants to focus on the environment and they want to focus on commenting. We want to focus on educating and making sure people understand the processes. So we'll be additive to that I hope, in the future. Great, thank you. I look forward to your presentation later. <laughs> Jordan Cove, that was a doozy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, you were saying that you're not an uh, advocacy office, which makes makes perfect sense. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with some operators, there are challenges in how they do their public engagement. And, and that, you know, to be honest, some operators just don't do it very well. It, will OPP, when they see things that could be done better in a specific process related to a specific project, reach out to that operator and say, hey guys, you're really missing the boat here um, in terms of how you're communicating with the stakeholders and with the communities along your route, the local governments along your, your proposed route. Is OPP going to do that sort of, it's not really advocacy, but it's working with the operator to make a better process? Yes, and yes. I think that's a, a well within our mandate to try to help the public. And if we have to you know, work on ourselves to help the public, and if we have to ask companies and operators and make suggestions to them, I think that's something that we will do. I'm wondering if you have or you have any plans for changing the way uh, scoping meetings are held. Um, for instance, uh, where I live, not only were there not scoping meetings in our county, and our, a lot of our folks had to travel many, many miles late at night to even get to a meeting to give a comment, um, 
but they were sequestered into a private room so that no one else could hear the question or the, more importantly, the answer. So that didn't seem quite fair to us as far as you know, putting that information out there, being transparent, giving others an opportunity to think about things that maybe they hadn't questioned before. Yes, and that's a comment I've heard. I, I couldn't tell you how many times across the country that people have concerns with that, that process. We are currently sitting in on some of the scoping sessions, you know, taking stock of what's going on and thinking about how we can recommend to uh, energy projects ways that they should think about, can think about, you know, improving their process. So that, that's something we will be doing. Um, we sat in on one a couple weeks ago, virtual meeting, which I thought was actually very interesting and helpful to have the, as an option in the scoping process. Because in areas where it's so remote, you know, it doesn't seem like it's justified or it's, it's a lot of work, you know, virtual option is nice. So, and obviously that's something we've done in the past, you know, two years during the pandemic is, is the virtual meeting. So, yes, we will be sitting in and we will be working with other FERC offices to improve those processes. So I've got five minutes left, so I think I have time for maybe one to two more questions. I think in our minds, a lot of things are on the table. You know, we want to help the public participate in the process, and we're going to look at everything that we can to do that. Hi, John. Uh, Sean Quinlan, Community Liaison, FEMSA. Um, I was just wondering what sort of outreach and engagement you're currently developing at the OPP for um, underserved communities. So we have a draft environmental justice outreach plan that we are, uh, we are revisiting and looking at just to see how we can, can do that work. It is certainly on our list of priorities, not only environmental justice communities, but indigenous populations and underserved, maybe rural populations. Uh, so we are developing or thinking about how we can reach out to them. And I mentioned you know, the AM radio, the newspapers, the flyers, trying to identify community leaders, you know, so-and-so knows somebody. Sometimes it's reaching out to the, the fire chief or the police chief, making sure that we're covering all those bases. I think sometimes we assume we're doing that, but then we're not. And then it's also following up with phone calls uh, not just a 20-page notice, you know, to whom it may concern. Can we individualize that contact a little bit and remind folks that these things are out there and stress to them their importance and our, our desire to have them participate in the process. So we've got a lot of things on the table, and I think we're looking to other agencies to see what they've done. But we hope to do a lot more of that in the near future. Last one, I think. Oh, I can get two more. Okay. Um, I think they, they want to bring the mic to you for the, oh, sure. the online crowd. I'm right here. Hi, uh, Kirk Talwa from Arizona State. Um, uh, one of the things that I had noted in the workshops uh, in the formation of OPP was the issues of uh, public's not really understanding jurisdictional you know, it, differences. And they say, oh, can you help me with this? And you say, oh, that's really not in our purview. Um, and one of the recommendations I had is that uh, FERC OPP should be working very closely with FEMSA community liaisons, equivalents at NTSB, um, state agencies that also have a stake in that particular project um, to at least uh, navigate them to the right person and ideally to actually coordinate with those other agencies so that you can be collectively sharing information. I Me mean, personally, I feel like that is a very worthwhile question that shouldn't have to be asked, right? You should be aware of each other and what you're doing in these same spaces. Well, the point's well taken and I'll, I'll point to carbon, sequ carbon sequestration pipelines. We've gotten a number of calls. What are you doing about carbon sequestration pipelines? And I think five years ago, not us, you know, and we point different directions to different agencies and, and that's where it ends. Now we're thinking, okay, let's not do that. Let's learn a little bit about carbon sequestration catch five plans. Let's make a contact so then we can refer to them. I was down in a project in Tex yeah, Texas where I got up to speed on the pipeline process in Texas for a carbon sequestration pipeline. So I could say, I don't know, that's not our jurisdiction. So I could then refer that over because the point is well taken. That's very frustrating for the public because then you're sent on a wild goose chase among federal agencies. So. We plan to do more of that. I don't think we want to just stop and say, not our jurisdiction. Last one. Actually, that's exactly what I was going to say. So it's not just FEMSA and FERC. It's also EPA and OSHA and the Chemical Safety Board and TSB. And, and just you just have the alphabet. Mm -hmm. But my point in particular, following up on Sean, we do have a focused effort that we're going to talk about here in a little bit 
uh, focusing on vulnerable communities. We have a plan, and so we probably should sync up and share ideas. Absolutely. So, I'm looking forward to the presentation. And we need to do, you know, as we've only been here for a year. We're a staff of 11. We're trying to get together and get with our sister agencies and the federal government and, you know, compare notes and make sure that we're in coordination, aware of each other's efforts, you know, when we can maybe be at a meeting together. Yeah, and we're not just pointing to whoever. And somebody asked me, can you prepare a, a graphic with all the agencies that are involved in permitting a project? I'm like, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, the arrows are all over here. And we're... It's still, we, we want to do it, but it's a lot. As you mentioned EPA, and you start getting down the state level and the local level, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. And I certainly understand people's frustrations. So thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy lunch, and I'll stick around for a few minutes, and I have cards if anybody wants to have, talk a little bit more. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, and I look forward to all the other presentations. Wow.